Hi there. Ooh, this is exciting. Super exciting. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I hope that is working. This is all new to me, so forgive me as I kind of get my bearings. Um, all right. Well, I'm super excited. Um, and I am glad that you're here on Valentine's Day. I've got my my heart t-shirt to celebrate. Um, what I plan on doing here today is I got a bunch of questions from my newsletter readers and I did my best to try to organize them in a way to kind of cover some main themes that I definitely know um, come up a lot in the rheumatology office for anyone dealing with autoimmune or they think they have an autoimmune condition. So we're gonna use the questions as kind of a jumping off point to talk about how to think about things, how to approach things um, so that you can end up getting answers and feeling better, right? Because that's the whole point. Um, if you're here, you probably already know who I am, um, but just in case you don't, and for some reason <laughs> you stumble into a rheumatology uh, Q&A, um, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. I am a rheumatologist. I've been practicing for over 15 years um, and I happen to love rheumatology. And what I have discovered is I love talking. And so I'm doing, uh, I put both together on YouTube um, in an effort to try to provide a lot of the information that I know we're not always getting in clinic. Um, I also know that the internet is full of a lot of contradictory and confusing information. And so my hope is to um, just provide some insights. Um, that's it. All right, so let's get started. Got a lot to go over. I am um, I am very focused on trying to keep this to an hour. Um, and you'll have to excuse me because I do have my notes because without my notes, this would definitely go on and ramble forever. So we're going to start with diet and how diet interacts with autoimmunity, how to think about diet. And I did get a number of questions that um, had a lot of different aspects, but kind of were around diet. And I thought that Tammy actually really summarized everything really nicely with her questions. And so I'm going to go through those questions and then give some context with some of the other stories that I heard um, to see if maybe it applies to you or, or you can relate. So the questions are, do you have many patients that are successful controlling their, sorry, do you have any patients that are successful at controlling their autoimmune diseases with a whole food plant-based diet and healthy lifestyle choices alone? Under what circumstances would you support or encourage your patients to try and stop their medications and control their inflammation with diet and lifestyle choices? What risks would you advise your patients of if they are considering stopping their medications? And then what guidelines for diet or lifestyle do you recommend? And then finally, how would your answers change depending on what autoimmune disease that person is facing? So I thought that was actually a really good set of questions. And just for context, um, she has a story of ankylosing spondylitis in the setting of celiac disease. I also heard from Lynn, who told a story of having seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. And seronegative is, um, that just means that someone doesn't have all the antibodies that you would typically see with a condition. And when we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, those two antibodies are gonna be the rheumatoid factor CCP. Um, so having seronegative rheumatoid arthritis really, really not sitting well with methotrexate, which is not uncommon, but also doing the autoimmune protocol diet. Um, and then I also heard from Maya, who had a question regarding mixed connective tissue disorder and the use of things like bone broth, turmeric, and ginger. So a lot of good questions about how we can incorporate diet into, um, into our treatment kind of regimen for autoimmune disease. And just also a note, um, in Tammy's story, there was use of pharmaceuticals, also changing of diet, and then being able to get off of that pharmaceutical. And so how, how often does that happen? So going back to those original questions, have I had patients who've been able to control their disease on diet and lifestyle alone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Diet and lifestyle have a big impact on our immune health. And so as a consequence, if you have autoimmune disease, they have a big impact on that as well. 
But then you really do, do need to get into the weeds, into the details. And this is where I think we're not getting the, inf the right information on the internet. Um, this is my main gripe with the information on the internet. You know, we tend to use blanket statements like all autoimmune disease can be cured by this particular diet. And then on the flip side, our offices, our doctor's offices aren't really addressing it either because it does matter what condition you're facing. And it's not that diet does an impact, but when we think about how much of an impact it can have and what is the likelihood that diet and lifestyle choices alone are going to enable you to become drug free. And there's this concept we call drug free remission, which a lot of people kind of think of that as a cure. I don't tend to use that word only because I have seen autoimmunity go in remission for so long and then years later come back. And the idea of a cure, I don't know, I just that I don't use that word. But we do use the word drug free remission, which is you're not needing any medications and your condition is in remission. So the way we approach it is going to be dependent on the condition someone has. And the things that I think about are going to be what condition it is, you know, um, some conditions are more amenable to diet and lifestyle changes. And this is not necessarily uh, documented in the literature. This is based on my experience. Things like psoriatic arthritis, Sjogren's um, tend to be more responsive than things like rheumatoid or lupus. But again, I, I hesitate even to say that because that's painting with too, bright of, too wide of a brush. Um, you're also going to look at what are the risk factors that this particular individual has for having long-term disease. And the risk factors are going to include things like smoking. What are the antibodies that that person has? If, someone's, if someone is seronegative versus seropositive, seronegative tends, I tend to think that has a better chance of being able to be controlled with diet and lifestyle, but again, not with everyone. And then finally, how severe was the condition when we first met? People who had multiple joints inflamed, people who had to get wheeled in in a wheelchair, people who I met in the hospital for the first time, that they tend to be in a more severe category. And I, although diet and lifestyle still make an impact, I don't tend to be as optimistic that they're going to get complete control just with diet and lifestyle alone. Um, so yes, the way I approach it is dependent on the condition that the person is facing, as well as the flavor of that condition and the severity of that condition. What are the guidelines, the diet and lifestyle guidelines that I'll typically um, recommend? So I don't, I don't typically prescribe to one particular type of diet. I do kind of on purpose use the general words of um, an anti-inflammatory diet. And the reason I do that is because there are a lot of factors that go into the personal decisions we each make about our diet. There's socioeconomic factors, there's cultural factors, and I do sometimes worry about overly restrictive diets um, impeding on our ability to live our life. Um, I also think that sometimes, you know, doing that big overhaul of your pantry and going like all in on some particular diet might help in the short term, but a lot of times people aren't able to um, maintain that kind of diet changes. And so I really keep it really simple you know, look at how much sugar, how much processed food you're eating and start whittling away at that. Um, start incorporating more anti-inflammatory foods, which are, you know, green leafy vegetables, those, those kinds of things um, in, into your diet. I also kind of use the diet conversation as a jumping off point to talk about lifestyle more broadly, um, because I have certainly seen a lot of people adopt pretty good diets. Um, you know, they're living their life, but they're, you know, they're not eating a lot of fast food. They're not, um, you know, eating a lot of junk and yet still have um, autoimmune symptoms and still need to see me, still need to be on some sort of medications. And what I've noticed is you can have people on with pretty good diets still need to see me. But what I've never seen is someone who has like really good handle of their stress management who needs to see me. And so 
when I say I use it as a jumping off point, I'm like, yes, let's talk about your diet, where we can make some tweaks. But I'd also like to talk about what are the stressors in your life? How are you handling them? What can we do to address them? Because we need to start looking at ways to lower your general cortisol level and get that sympathetic nervous system. That's that fight or flight, like overactive nervous system that does impact your immune system. How can we kind of get that to calm down so that we, that will also have an impact on your autoimmune condition, the need for medicines, the risk of flares. So we have to talk about all of it. Um, and, you know, this is really highlighted in one of the stories, you know, going back to Lynn's story with the seronegative RA, um, really not tolerating methotrexate, starting an anti or the anti, what's it called? The autoimmune, uh, and autoimmune protocol diet. And for those of y'all who don't know, this is a lot of places on the internet. It's basically a elimination diet where you eliminate a lot of foods while paying attention to your symptoms. And one by one, you start bringing back foods, again, trying to find what uh, is maybe triggering your symptoms. It is not a diet that's meant to be long-term. It's supposed to be in a short amount of time. Um, I don't necessarily prescribe it. Um, again, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the overly restrictive stuff, but I have seen it work for some people in that it helps them identify certain foods that are particularly triggering. But what I thought was interesting in the story was, although she had done that and was feeling better, still needed some medication and still having some joint pain. And that is very often what I see. You can um, definitely gain a lot from these diet changes, but I think we need to maybe uh, adjust our expectations about the likelihood of being able to come off all medications. The other thing I wanted to say just about that story was there was uh, maybe some confusion about like how much we need to tolerate medicines that make us feel bad. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's a side effect and, but I have to take this for a long time. Like, absolutely no. Like the point of my medicines is to make you feel better. And I'm never going to say that there isn't some side effects that sometimes we have to just learn how to deal with. But in general, if a medicine is making you miserable, then you got to go back to your doctor and ask for other options because usually, usually there are other options. Now, also talking specifically about the bone broth, turmeric and ginger. So turmeric and ginger are known to have a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. They are excellent things to add to your, you know, cooking, spi you know, your spices on, in your kitchen. Bone broth, I actually had to look up. I mean, I know there's a lot on the internet about bone, bone broth. Um, there was some interesting mouse studies looking at uh, some changes in the inflammatory proteins with bone broth. It's a pretty big leap to go from some cellular changes in a mouse to, you know, curing autoimmune disease in a human. But all that being said, bone broth, turmeric, ginger, any other kind of supplement you want to take, for the most part, the risk is going to be low to making these di diet changes. And so I think in that, in those kind of cases, the risk benefit ratio is definitely in your favor. And so if you like eating that stuff, then go for it. All right. Um, I can't, it's really hard for me to uh, talk and think about all this and keep an eye on the um, chat. So I'm going to do my best um, here. All right. Next question was from H and it was about sleep, which I love. I love talking about sleep. I also love a good night's sleep. Um, so what supplements to improve quality of sleep do you recommend for your patients? Um, I'm, yes, so what, what supplements for to improve sleep? Um, so sleep is huge, 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 kind of similar to stress. It's very rare for me, although it does happen, very rare for me to see patients in my office who, when I ask them, you know, how's your sleep? For them to give me a solid great. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, it's off and on. A lot of people are like, I haven't had a good night's sleep in years. When I ask, when was the last time you felt rested in the morning and you get that blank look, then you know, okay, we, we need to deal with this. Um, what can be frustrating about sleep is there is no quick fix. This there isn't anything out there that will you can pop or sip or take that will just knock you out and get you that good sleep. Pharmaceuticals, alcohol, CBD, they might knock you out, but we now know that that's not getting you the good restful type of sleep that we, we need whenever we have an autoimmune condition. Um, so my favorite is melatonin. I know